Hey, you geeks. I'm doing it. I'm finally ranking the Wheel of Time books on my objectively infallible scale according to personal preference. Although usually I have a hard time ranking things because unless a book is particularly good or particularly bad, I will like it generally. Basically, I've just been putting anybody who looks like a good guy into Gryffindor, anybody who looks like a bad guy into Slytherin, and the other two can just go wherever the hell they want. <laughs> Turns out the Wheel of Time has books that fit both extremes, so I can sort the rest of the books accordingly. I'll give a general spoilers warning as I go through all the books of the series, but this video is only going to be like 20 minutes long and there are 14 books, so it won't go too in depth. I'll be ranking them in the order I read them, which means we are starting with New Spring. Let's start at the very beginning. We're going to put this one in Nothing Happened. Not a great place to start. I know better now that this is just a beginning of the Wheel of Time, not the beginning. However, this book is kind of redundant. The best parts are already told in The Great Hunt, and the extra filler is just that. More Aes Sedai scheming, dress tryings on, and even the end of the war is kind of lame. Though I will admit that most of the problems I had with it the first time was just me not knowing Jordan's writing style. If I ever decide to reread this, I might enjoy it more, but it's still not great. Next, The Eye of the World is a good read, or a good finder. It's Hufflepuff. It's not exceptionally good or exceptionally evil, and it adequately starts the story. I will admit on rereads after finishing the series, the boring stuff I had found when I began now have aged like a fine wine on the Wheel of Time, and they are very endearing. What is this? Are you trying to trick me? And where's the sports? However, that plotting is still a problem, and the final act coming right the heck out of nowhere is not great. Although I love what it went on to inspire and the story it began, this book in of itself is good, not fantastic. The Great Hunt is fantastic. This is where the story really takes off and finally has that feel of the modern epic fantasy series that this that I was promised upon picking up these books. And it is the moment you've been waiting for. It spans the continent and weaves many characters' stories together. And also, the ending was properly foreshadowed. However, I can't stand Celine, and it's just not something I return to again and again. For when I do, something sour in hindsight. Rand has become extra whiny and does not say I'm not a lord as good as Matt does in later books. And I can't believe I liked Gawain in this story. Though there's little to distinguish him from Galad. In the end, all of the pieces of this book do add up to an extremely satisfying conclusion Yet, it's just not gold yet. The Dragon Reborn. This one strikes gold. <laughs> this book is just slightly better written than The Great Hunt and just slightly tighter for a plot and that just slight modification pushes it over the edge into gold. Though the most important addition is this new and improved mat. Here comes the smolder. This is kind of an off day for me. This doesn't normally happen. This new mat is far better than the 
whiny sod that had been dragging behind Rand the entire way. That being said, I do understand that this plot is sort of a rinse and repeat of the last book, except for Rand is the wild card, not Fane. But knowing Rand has gone back guano crazy makes the whole story come together for me in a way that The Great Hunt didn't quite reach until my fifth time through. Yet despite the Rand issues, this book is pure gold. Barely, but gold. The Shadow Rising is also gold, and more golden than The Dragon Reborn. This is where each of the characters begin to have their own storylines and are not just caught up in Rand's weave. Specifically, Perrin's arc in The Two Rivers is basically perfection, though there is one exception, what should have given me an early clue to the John Wayne Western vibe that undercuts, for me, this entire series. Here's a good stick to beat the lovely lady. Thanks. Also, Matt does slide a bit back into his unhelpful, annoying character traits because he's only around Rand. Overall, this book was such fun fun that I didn't mind that it slowed down to build the world of the Aiel and ultimately give Rand a less than climactic battle with Osmodian instead of Baalzamon, which was also fine because the Osmo because the Baalzamon on plot had been beaten like a dead horse. The Fires of Heaven is also gold and possibly higher than the, the Shadow Rising. And call me crazy, but I like Nynaeve and Elaine's time in Val and Luca's traveling circus. The pacing of this book really takes off because Rand takes Kyrian and Matt kills Kuladin all by the midpoint. And then the book keeps going, spinning out new plot threads as Rand moves to take Camelin and Robin, and Moraine makes her move against Lanfear, and everything explodes at once, and the fires of heaven come crashing down. And this is the book where I finally began to feel like I understood enough of the magic system to know what was going on in Rand's big epic battles. Which is good. So good, it's gold. Lord of Chaos. This book is going back down into fantastic, and unfortunately it's slightly less fantastic than The Great Hunt. It says a lot that I consistently forget where this book lies in the series, and frankly for this video I had to look it up. With Maureen out of the picture, it's no wonder that Rand's plots began to spiral out of control, but this is also where Jordan begins to take delight in filling us all in on the mundane and overbearing details of his existence, and it very much slows the plot down. We're going in circles! What? Again! Circles is a good thing. I mean, they're, uh, yeah, they're, so cool. they're circular. But the upside is that while Rand's arc spirals out of control, Matt, Perrin's, and the girls really begin to take off with their various quests, either off to save the Bull of the Winds, or in Perrin's case, save Rand, sorry behind. I want to take a moment to address my theory on why the center books of the Wheel of Time are commonly referred to as the slog. In my mind, it's actually three mega novels that may have been the original idea Jordan pitched to Tor, wherein this book and The Crown of Swords was one novel, possibly named The Bull of the Winds, where it is all about the girls taking the Bull of the Winds and Rand taking Ilion. However, when Jordan sat down to write these books, he got a little carried away. 
Thus, we have scenes of Ran taking the maidens to Shadar Logoth, which doesn't get paid off until the end of Crown of Swords. Yet, bloated as this book was, I just love Perrin's arc, and of course, the explosive ending at Dumai's Wells. Fighting soldiers from the sky. Silver wings upon their chest. Those drag this book up from good into fantastic. The Crown of Swords. In my original review, I called this book fine enough, and I'll call it good here. Here. It's probably on the same level as The Eye of the World, actually. It provides adequate and even epic endings for all the arcs begun in Lord of Chaos. I do like Matt and the girls' dynamic in Ibu Dar, though Matt and Tylan's dynamic was uncomfortable. Me? Well, you're not exactly Superman, but you're awfully available. Yeah, now, don't get any ideas, Judy. I'm not the marrying kind. Though I did not need quite so many details about Egwene settling in as Armorlin, and Rand taking Ilion kind of comes out of nowhere, and it's not until much later do we realize how important it is that his and Moradin's balefire beams crossed paths in Shadar Logoth. On its own, this book just feels unfinished. Together with Lord of Chaos, they could have possibly created a book that was golden, but as just half of what I would consider a full story, this book is good. Just good. Path of Daggers. Breaking new ground for this video, this book destroyed me. In the best sense. The game of life is hard to play. I'm gonna lose it anyway. Lacking Matt, this book wasn't very fun to read, yet it contains the brutality necessary for this series to continue down its serious and realistic look at the effect of war on the people who fight it. Though it doesn't begin there. The first third tells what I would imagine is the epilogue of the mega novel of The Bull of the Winds, and the last two-thirds begin the mega novel of that I imagine is called The Heart of Winter. This is where we stray into Apocalypse Now territory, with Rand ripping through the jungles of Altara while also getting steadily more and more insane. This gives me heavy Apocalypse Now vibes, which incidentally is based off of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness which is based off of Belgium's conquest of the Congo. The deeper the story gets, the crazier everything is. And that's what I want this book to be all about. But it's burdened down with just other stuff that it's just a depressing mess, which is realistic and necessary, but utterly destroyed me as a reader. Winter's Heart. Okay, fine, I'll put this in fantastic. The Battle of Shadow Logoth and the Cleansing of Sidene is just as good of a sequence as Dumai's Wells. The slowness and seemingly randomness of Rand's arc is balanced out by the, dare I say, fun, or at least epic, parts of Matt's arc where he overcomes the women who seeks to control him, save women he despises because it's the right thing to do, and set off more fireworks. This book also adequately finishes off the arcs begun in Last Book, particularly how Rand has finally reached the end of the river on the road to Crazy in the aptly named town Far Madding. It smelled like slow death in there. Malaria. Nightmares. Path of Daggers and Winter's Heart together have a 
golden through storyline that kept me invested despite the books being bloated and meandering. This underlying investment was very important because the next book is Crossroads of Twilight. In sum, for Crossroads of Twilight, nothing happens. God! God! Sanderson has said that Jordan experimented with making a book that was entirely the first act of a larger plot. Though, admittedly, I think that Jordan has written more interesting first acts in shorter novels. Elaine's part is so particularly dull that when I reviewed character arcs, I reviewed her tea. Although, in hindsight, I've discovered that if I were attracted to women, I would have reviewed her bathtub. It is such hard work maintaining perfection, but a worthy effort, don't you think? On the bright side, it did feature Egwene suffering under compulsion and possibly breaking free, like Morghais had done before, though it's so difficult to tell, which I can now appreciate is epic foreshadowing for Perrin's arc in A Memory of Light. There are stuff going on beneath the currents, but on the whole, this book has nothing happening. Nothing's ever going to happen here. You gotta go where things happen. Knife of Dreams is pure gold, and I'm going to put it at the top of the gold because it's Jordan's last full swan song, so it gets extra credit for that. So dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. But also, the golden crane rides for Tarman Garden. Perrin takes Malden, Matt at wages war in Altara, and Rand has gone totally insane. Despite her best efforts, Elaine secures her crown, and Egwene is largely absent. It's everything I love about this series rolled into one book. There is not a thing wrong with this book, and most importantly, after my expectations were significantly lowered after Crossroads of Twilight, it ratcheted them right back up again as we prepare for the final battle. Beginning with The Gathering Storm, which destroyed me. Despite it being the name, more or less, of a chapter from The Hobbit, this book utterly destroyed me. It has pretty clear flaws. Sanderson's mat is off, and Gowen is now a major POV character with his incompetence? Ugh. Ultimately, this book is a work of great and terrible beauty. Rand, like Path of Daggers, has set out on a campaign where he is intentionally making things as miserable as possible for himself. And it is zero fun for the reader. No. Make up your mind. No, no. Think, since you're thinking, now go on, think. No, is no. it fun? No, sir. No. No, sir. Absolutely not? Zero fun, sir. With Rand's arc, although ultimately redemptive, Sanderson knows how to rip out a person's emotion and wrangle them in front of you. And it is terrible in the best way. Towers of Midnight is hands down, pure gold, my favorite Wheel of Time book ever. It's almost impossible to sum up. The plot flies on the wind that was once called Mariah. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Sanderson has truly grasped the world that Jordan left behind with its undercurrents of great American literature and the Wild West. Egwene has once again become a little Scarlet O'Hara who is utterly unlikable on her quest to never ever be chained again. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And that is balanced by Perrin and Matt's separate pure awesomeness. Again, this is another book with not a thing wrong with it, so I name it Gold. A Memory of Light is still gold, but 
The revelation about Perrin's character arc has knocked it down to definitely behind Towers of Midnight and possibly behind Knife of Dreams. Just because I feel that that is a betrayal of Perrin's true to Rand character and undercuts his big moment of choosing Rand over Fayil. Instead, it's all just Lanfear's compulsion, maybe? It's not great. Despite those little hiccups, everything else comes together in the last battle to end all battle. This is the ultimate showdown. the light triumph over the dark with cannons roaring in the last battle as if it were the war of 1812. Though really it was the war of 1805. Then one lone cowboy rides off into the sunset alone and with a lit pipe. I have to ride off into the sunset. Oh! Ride like the wind, bullseye! <laughs> In broad strokes, this series shouldn't have ended any other way, and A Memory of Light is pure gold for it. Thus, the majority of this series we see is pure gold, though it does have its low points. So that's my ranking. Let me know your thoughts on that. On that down in the comments. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more and hit that notification bell because YouTube will otherwise hide my videos from you and then we all suffer for that. Thanks for watching. Bye!